On today's episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored, Dr. Roddy Raban will tell you exactly why he became a plastic surgeon, why he is so passionate about making sure that his patients are informed, and why he's out here in Beverly Hills, the mecca of makeovers, trying to right the wrongs before they become really wrong. Hi, I'm Monique Marvez, writer, performer, air talent, here with board-certified Beverly Hills plastic surgeon, Dr. Roddy Raban, and we are launching, I'm very excited about this, Plastic Surgery Uncensored. Now, I have to ask, is Roddy short for something? Well, it's not really short. It, it's, well, it's a long story. That's what happens when you have ethnic par- uh, parents. It's actually, Sherrod is my first name. Wow. Roddy is my middle name. And Roddy is a truncated version of Sherrod. Roddy is the nickname. But I've gone by Roddy since I was, I don't know, three, two, something like that. So I'm guessing your parents weren't from Brooklyn. No. The east side. <laughs> Where were east they? side of Iran. Uh, <laughs> from uh, Tehran. In Iran. And, I, and I'm asking because it, it's so interesting. When I first met you, you spoke to me in English and Spanish. Yeah. And, uh, and I like that you care about diversity, but let me not get ahead of myself. We're here with Dr. Roddy Raban in Beverly Hills. You are a board certified plastic surgeon. Correct. Right yeah. here in Beverly right Hills. Here, right in the middle of, the, as I refer to the eye of the hurricane. The eye of the hurricane. This is the epicenter, the mecca of changing your face. Sure. The mecca of makeovers, if you will. Indeed. Beautiful. Now, my my question is, why a podcast? Here you are. Clearly, you're in an exclusive place, a board-certified plastic surgeon, this beautiful Hollywood Regency office, and yet a podcast? Why? Um, well, the reason is, I mean, I've been in practice almost 15 years, and, and I've been really blessed in that during this journey, I've had an opportunity to take care of hundreds of thousands of patients. And in that process, you know, my practice slowly morphed over time and little by little i started to see sort of an influx more and more of revisional type cases revisional meaning people who had had a breast dog and it didn't go well a mommy makeover and they were unhappy and so what slowly happened to me as a practitioner is i started finding myself constantly trying to educate these patients and then as i started to see all these revisions i started it started to change the way i saw primaries in other words as i saw all these patients coming in from all over the country now all over the world with complications it started to change the way that i communicate with my primary or patients coming in for the first time and i spent so much time every day um trying to educate patients on how to navigate this whole process you know plastic surgery can be it's like an as you know it's a double-edged sword Mm -hmm. it can be the most amazing thing you've ever done it can be simultaneously worst thing you ever decided to do and so the question then becomes as is for everybody patients How the hell do I decide? How do I make sure that I fall on the right side of that fence? And so what I do every day is one by one, patient by patient, I tell them the specifics of how to get through this process, how to avoid becoming a statistic. And so when you do this on a daily basis, patient by patient, you start to realize like, holy shit, I need to, I I really need to get this message out. And so that's when I decided, you know what, I think a podcast is a perfect um, platform in order to get the message out about plastic surgery. And the message being not that plastic surgery isn't safe or isn't good, but there is a right way and a wrong way. And that if you know, like it is with every other decision in life, how to do things the right way, you should end up having an outstanding outcome. And that's what I want for patients. I want patients to do well. So there's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of outright false information out there is what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a multitude of things. I think one is people, it's it's complex. And I know that patients feel like it's being demystified it's really not being demystified it's being dumbed down because you know the cosmetic world wants patients to think it's no big deal so that they're more likely to do so one is that people are under the impressions it's not a big deal so they're mis- misinformed in that regard some of the information that they're getting is just flat out inaccurate right they're biased so like you go on a website and the information there is not right and then there's a ton of crap now with social media and instagram and facebook So there's like a million sources of information coming into an average patient. And it's just, to be be honest, it's very difficult to figure out truth from fiction. And you found yourself repeating in very broad strokes the same things over and over to your primaries. Is that that basically what you want to do now is give like the basic, let's say the ABCs of plastic surgery so that when somebody comes to you, maybe they've already looked this up and listened to this podcast and You could tell them this is a very basic thing you need to know or not know. It seems that what you're saying is 
You were repeating yourself a lot for your primaries, and you want to put that information out there accurately and correctly. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I feel like I'm like the David Horowitz meets the Geraldo meets the, <laughs> you know, I feel like somebody, uh, don't get me wrong, I'm obviously not the only guy that does this, but I think there's a handful of really passionate plastic surgeons who want to help their patients do what it is that we do, which is get great outcomes. And we live in an amazing time, right? We have access to all these new technologies. So like everything, like a nuclear bomb, it can be used for good and it can be used for bad. And I want to use all this technology, i.e. a podcast, for benefit, right? Because I think that for the most part, most of the stuff is garbage. I think the Instagram accounts, if you really sat down and looked at them, they're ridiculous. I think the Facebook and some of the uh, uh, videos, and it's just becomes more and more and more scandalous. And I think we need, to, this is an opportunity for us to reverse it a little bit and bring a little bit of honor back to plastic surgery and bring a little bit of respect because at the end of the day, it was a profession that was at one point very highly respected. Now I almost feel like if like people ask me, oh, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a doctor. <laughs> oh, wow. What, what, what kind of doctor? Um, I'm a surgeon. What, what kind of surgeon? Like I'm, a, I'm almost embarrassed to tell people I'm a plastic surgeon because when I say I'm a plastic surgeon, whether you like it or not, you have this image and this vision and you automatically think of Hollywood and, you know, glitz and glam and all that garbage. And that's, rea and that's not the reality of the profession. You're lumped in with the guys with less ethics or what you're basically well, saying. There's a lot of people that don't have your ethics. Well, there's just a lot of people that are doing it differently. Okay. And Fair at enough. the end of the day, I'm, you know, I'm here not to talk about myself as much as I am trying to, you know, I'm trying to get information out to the masses because plastic surgery is not going anywhere. It's growing by the minute as I think it should, because I think it's amazing. And I just wish that people would do it the right way rather than the wrong way. And so I want to get the message out. That's really the bottom line. So before you were a little bit embarrassed to tell people what you did, you were you are clearly very passionate. When did you decide to be a plastic surgeon versus another type of doctor? I think, you know, I always knew, you know, when I was in elementary school, I always I was always good at arts and crafts and things of that nature, which I think people intuitively think plastic surgeons are artistic. I would say maybe 15% of them really are. The rest just are not. So I was always very good at art and things of that nature. And then I got into college and I was good at science. I wasn't very good at the liberal arts and things of that nature. And at first I wanted to be an architect. And I love design. I designed this office. I designed my home. I love photography. And I love all those kinds of things. And I wanted to be an architect. And I went and talked to a few architects. And as do most professionals, they complained and said how terrible their lives were. And it kind of like shifted gears. And then I had gone to college. And I, when I was in college, I, I was a biochemistry major. And I knew that I wanted to do something in the sciences. But at the same time, I was like, well, what the hell am I going to do in the sciences? That's even remotely artistic. I mean, cardiology doesn't really have much art to it. No. You know, if you're a nephrologist, it's not very, very, no, a very. Kidney's not pretty. No, nah, you know, it's, it's pretty, but it's really got one shape. And then so <laughs> I, uh, and then so ultimately I, I had an opportunity to shadow this plastic surgeon in my thing. And it was like, it was like, it was like the way people I imagine describe it when you see your child come out of your wife's belly. It's like you have instant love. And so I watched wow. a rhinoplasty and I was like blown away. You either pass out or you're inspired. It's one of those, it's one of those pivotal moments. And I was like, wow, this is incredible. And so I pretty much decided I want to be a plastic surgeon very early on in college. And then I never looked back and I just pretty much just been on that track for a very long time. Very good plastic surgery borders on the magic. It yeah, really does. Yeah, it yeah, borders yeah. on the magical. Yeah. It's got a, a little bit of a mystical ele element sure. to it. And and we talked a lot about training before we, we sat, you and I have talked. And, you know, training is one of those things that I think people need to know immediately. Is there a, you're, you're a board certified plastic surgeon? Correct, yeah. What does board certified mean? So I have a lot of pet peeves. People who know me know that I have a lot of uh, pet peeves and I get irked very easily because <laughs> I'm bothered by all of the BS. And so, listen, if you go and ask even my own patients and you say, okay, well, you love Dr. Raban. He's amazing. He did a great job. What school did he go to? Uh, crickets. No idea. Um, you know, where did he graduate from? What, you know, what did, no one really knows. And unfortunately, no one gives a shit. What people care about is how many followers you have on Instagram. People care about who the celebrity that endorsed you is. 
And so we've really lost, we're way off track on this because while training isn't everything, in other words, you know, if you're a Harvard graduate, it doesn't automatically make you better than some other, but training is invaluable. And so the problem that we have today, and I think there's a whole movement, I don't know how well it's going to take, but there is, there should be a movement of transparency. That's my, what's one of my biggest pet peeves, transparency. So the problem is cosmetic surgery is the most confusing area of all of medicine. When you go to I agree. when you go to your doctor with a brain tumor, they're a neurosurgeon. That's it. Done. You don't you don't ask questions. They're a neurosurgeon. Who yeah. else would be doing it? But when you go to get a breast dog, the question you would have to ask is what kind of doctor are you? The general public thinks that everyone's a plastic surgeon. Why? Because that's the lingo that everybody uses. But the truth of the matter is today that is hardly the case. I mean, hardly the case. Really? So what you have is you have alphabet soup. So you have the <laughs> alphabet soup. So you have all these words, right? Okay. You have plastic surgery and cosmetic surgery. What's the difference? I thought they were the same thing. I, know, I thought but they were synonyms. No, they're not. They used to be synonyms, but now there's a whole world of confusion. So let me give you this. Let me break it down for you. Okay. So when I went to medical school and then I went to residency, residency was when I got my training. I trained in plastic surgery. Somebody else trained in OBGYN. Somebody else trained in head and neck surgery. Somebody else trained in orthopedics. There are specialties that are um, approved by the ACGME, which is the overriding body. Then when I finished, I went into private practice. So I became a plastic surgeon. Then I went and got board certified. So the first thing you need to know is once you graduate, it doesn't necessarily mean you're board certified. That's another higher level of train. Um, testing that says that you, you know, you know what you're doing. So you have board certified plastic surgeon. I like to refer to them as the lions in the jungle. Then you have plastic surgeons that never went and got board certified. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So it's not like the bar. You don't have to be no, board certified no, to practice. Not, not at all. Okay. You, you know, no. there's a lot of people that wouldn't. No, of course not. So, so there's unboard certified. No, plastic you have a medical license, which would be the equivalency of being bo uh, a bar. So you have a medical license. Okay. So you know you you pass the bar. You got your you got your license to practice law, and you've the same thing with law. This is this is saying that you've passed certain certifications that make you even more well trained. Okay. So you have board certified plastic surgeons. Then you have plastic surgeons who never got board certified. Okay. You know which is fine, but then you have to ask yourself why not, right? That's the question. And, th and then you have this whole other world, and this whole other world collectively is called cosmetic surgeons. And in that whole other world fall the following surgeons. Okay. So you have ENTs, ear, nose, and throat, doctors who get additional training and become facial plastic surgeons. In other words, they are ENTs that do cosmetic surgery of your face, right? So nose jobs, facelifts. So you can get it done by a plastic surgeon or a facial plastic surgeon. The problem is that's not the problem. The the problem is they're trained and that's fine. The problem is many of them drop the word facial and they call themselves plastic surgeons who like to specialize in the head and neck. And many of the ENTs do breast dogs. I was just going to say, do they slide out of their the field? Isn't it the most so, natural? So what ends up, the problem right now is that it's everyone is cross-pollinating. Why? Everyone needs to know what what is the reason for things. Why are people migrating from... Guatemala to America because their quality of life there sucks. That's why they're leaving. Sure. Why are people leaving, you know, their specialties going elsewhere? Because healthcare has changed a lot. Reimbursements are terrible and doctors are moving towards specialties that they feel are going to be more lucrative. Let's start with that. Okay. So what happens is the ENTs, if they were doing just their cosmetics of their head and neck, well, they're trained to do that. But when they start doing boob jobs and tummy tucks and lipo, we got a problem. So those guys are... Facial plastics, drop the facial, are plastic surgeons that do blah, blah, blah. Then you have oculoplastics. Those are ophthalmologists who do eyelid surgery and cosmetics of the eyelid. They drop the word oculoplastics. Then you have dermatologists doing facelifts. Then you have... O dermatologists doing facelifts? Correct. Dermatologists doing facelifts. Then you have OBGYNs doing tummy tucks. You have orthopedists doing liposuction. So what has happened is all of these people call themselves cosmetic surgeons. So there is no cosmetic surgery school, not like orthopedics and OBGYN. There's no training program that's- so There's by no the board certification in cosmetic no, surgery. No, it doesn't exist. No. So what happens is 
they collectively call themselves cosmetic surgeons. And this is a huge, huge group of people. And they created their own meetings and they created their own fellowships and training and they're trying to legitimize it. And again, I'm not here to say what's right and wrong. Can I say it? That no. sounds like a shortcut. Well, it is what it is. <laughs> I'm not here to even say that. Let's say there's a guy who's a cosmetic surgeon. He's an OB She's an OBGYN that does tummy tucks. And let's just say... For the sake of this discussion, sure. she's amazing. Okay. Like her results are unbelievable. Okay. The question and the issue is not that whether or not she should or shouldn't do that. That's not for me to decide. That's mm -hmm. for the, you know, people think there's this umbrella, arching umbrella, big brother. There is no big brother. The government doesn't know. And there's no, no one is supervising this. Just FYI. The only issue I have, which is a big one, is transparency. Mm -hmm. When you go to that doctor's website, they're going to say they're a board certified cosmetic surgeon. So listen carefully. That means they are board certified in OBGYN and they're practicing cosmetic surgery. Do you see how that is hmm. very misleading? Yes. So again, transparency. If you're an OBGYN and you got additional training and you're doing tummy tucks, your patients should know that. And the question is, 100%. well, what the problem is patients are... The argument is, well, they need to look, but then you have to really scour. And so I think what we need to do is we need to make it so that when you walk into a doctor's office, their training is like forced into your face. Like I am certified by so-and-so and so-and-so. So at any rate, I don't even know how I digress, but the, no, I am no, a plastic I, surgeon and I am board, board certified, certified and I'm board certified in plastic surgery. So, you know. And my question, okay, so where did you go to school? Um, I did my undergrad. I've been a Southern California boy all my life. So I did my undergrad at UCLA. I did my medical school at UCSD. I did my general surgery and plastic surgery residencies at USC. So, I mean, I covered all the ground of Southern California. So you've been in the mecca of makeovers since day one. Yeah. You've seen it and, all. And I went to a high school at Beverly Hills High School. So I'm a local boy. It doesn't get any fancier. Yeah, yeah it's real fancy. You were surrounded by nose jobs from day one. Yes, that's true. Yeah. I can true. only imagine your high school class, you know, yes, yes. what they look like, but the before and after. Correct. Do they look better now in their high school Unf uh, graduation Unf pictures? Unfortunately, they've, they've not so not so much. <laughs> all right. Well, what, one of the things, I mean, you're a Southern California boy, but and, and you speak Spanish, which I mentioned earlier, but one of the things that I really loved about you is that when we talked about beauty, you are sensitive to the fact that different cultures have different ideals of beauty. We talked extensively about this nose versus that nose, or, you know, I'd, I'd like you to elaborate a little bit because you're saying that within the, um, you know, Asian American, African American, Latinos, and, and Middle Eastern, or I don't even know if you say Middle Eastern American, that that they're sort of being homogenized or, or told this is pretty and this isn't pretty. And that's, you're not about that. Well, I just think the problem in general with plastic surgery, it's an art form, right? So sure. who's to say that you like abstract art versus contemporary art? It's not for me to decide. I have my own aesthetics and I have my own taste. And I have found that when people come and say, oh my God, Dr. Bon, your work is so amazing. Uh, what, you know, it's so natural, right? We love the word natural. What the hell is natural? What makes something natural or unnatural? And what it really comes down to is recognizability. So when something starts to look unnatural, it's when the normal features start to disappear. So when you're African-American and you have African-American features, and then all of a sudden those features are obliterated. And how does that happen? Is so, it a thinning of the nose? No, is no, it a so, changing? So, so for example, I'll give you a perfect example. One thing that is, we talk about ethnic diversity is rhinoplasty, right? Okay, so yeah. a nose really defines people, right? An African-American nose is different than a Middle Eastern nose is different than an Asian nose, correct? Yeah. And so when you do a rhinoplasty, which is one of my, one of my specialties, if you get too extreme or overdo it, you're going to notice that the features that make somebody African-American, let's say the nostrils are a little wider and they'd like to make them a little smaller. Okay, understood. But if you make them really w narrow... They're going to look like many of the celebrities that we know that we would use as examples, which I'll refrain from, that look classically overdone or done. You know, when someone says African-American bad rhinoplasty, everyone has an image in their mind. Why is that that everybody unanimously thinks of the same people? It's because those images are not reflective of a natural looking nose in that, that ethnic group. And so I think the key is not, you know, there's no formula. There's no formula to beautiful art. There's no formula to beautiful music. It's just something makes sense and something doesn't.
for me personally, I've come to realize, you know, you know, they're saying less is more overdoing things. The extreme nature of things tends to almost invariably make things look ethnically incongruent. So my philosophy is less is more and try to keep people looking balanced rather than overdone. That's really what it comes down to. And and again, and I'm just going to tell you personally, yeah. I had a nose job many, many, many years ago in Miami, and I told him that I didn't want to not look like me. The issue was that, you know, my profile was quite flat. And I said, whenever I turned my face on camera, I was just starting to do stand up. I said, I look like a cat, you know, face on. It looks good. I turn sideways. It's, you know, like a cat. And but I was I was adamant with him. I want I want to look like me and the funny thing is my whole family complained and said you you threw away your money you look the same yeah but i felt like i i wanted that yeah and i, I think still this, look latina yeah, i don't yeah. have a little totally. little apple seed nostrils and a little ski i i yeah. don't it's totally and i think the problem you know you know one of the biggest challenges in plastic surgery is this idea that someone comes to you with an idea <laughs> With a dream. With Let's just call it what it is. No, but with an idea of what they want. Yeah. And they're using a bunch of adjectives to describe to you what they want. And then you're supposed to produce it. So it gives them, I want to look cute. I want to look pretty. I want to look natural. I want to look like myself. I want, they all, we all think we know what that means, but it all means something slightly different to everybody. And so the danger, and I never, ever allow patients to communicate to me with adjectives. I want to look cute. I don't know what that means, ma'am. I want to look pretty. Haven't got a clue. How about natural? No idea. You have to speak to me in specifics. Engineering. You don't say to an engineer, hey, make that building a little bigger. What well, bigger what? Mm -hmm. You mean two, two, two meters? What? So, you know, the, 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 the danger, the, what's lost in translation today is that doctors don't care or that's a, that's a big phrase. Doctors don't have the time nor the energy or the want to sit down and actually decode the conversation. Patient X comes in, they have this idea. They describe a bunch of general terms. Doctor says, mm-hmm, got it, sure. Mm, you're going to look great. Uh-huh, okay. Then all of a sudden, and in his mind, he's got what he thinks. And all of a sudden, poof, that's what it is. Well, what if you don't like it? Or what if you don't think that looks natural or pretty or cute? So I am very particular about the consultation process. And we languaging. spend a ton of time on languaging. So when patients say things like that, I force them. And you, you'll be shocked how many patients are uncomfortable with me being like, okay, I don't know what that means. Now describe it to me in specifics. And what do you think causes the discomfort? Well, because they've never actually thought about it. They've never actually broken down into like, I'm like, so is it the hump specifically? Is it your nostril is three millimeters too wide? Is it your tip is bulbous? Oh yeah, let me look in the mirror. And so what happens is that really makes sure that she and I are on the same page or he and I are on the same page. And, and I think and that's you have really them important. Describe it. Yes, it's, as opposed to using adjectives. It's funny you should say that because I was I was probably a good patient. I was 21 and I went in and I, you know, turned my head in many directions so he could see. And I said, I just want a little more profile. And this was in the 80s. And you'll probably be horrified. He took a piece of cartilage out of the back of my no, ear. No, we do that all. We do, I do that every. You can feel the little piece that's missing. Yeah. And put it on the tip of my nose. Yeah, we do that. That's a good. That's good. It, uh, I'm, you're happy, right? I'm delighted. Okay. Beautiful. Now, I, you were mentioning earlier that a lot of people come to you from around the world. And you even said like hundreds of, you've been doing this 15 years. How much of your practice do you think is revisions? People that just didn't get all the information, didn't describe properly, went to the, are there doctors, I'm just going to say it, that are somewhat of mills. They don't care about the description because they have one way of doing things. There was a doctor in Miami. We knew who when somebody got a nose by him because everybody's nose looked the same. It was like the Rachel haircut. So. Yeah. I mean, I think my practice, unfortunately, um, has progressively become more revisional. You know, when I first started, it wasn't that way. And now I would say probably at least a third of my practice is revision. Wow. A third. Yeah. A third. When we come back, can we talk more revisions? Absolutely. You are listening to Plastic Surgery Uncensored with Dr. Roddy Raban on Revolver Podcast. An enormous part of Dr. Roddy Raban's practice is revising other doctors' work. Over 30%, he said. Just like an artist, a clean canvas is the very best way to start. But unfortunately, when a patient has had a bad result, the doctor does not have the luxury. He has to get in there on a canvas that's already been compromised. And Dr. Raban 
has to correct and perfect. I was absolutely stunned, Dr. Raban, to hear what percentage of your practice was revisions. A third. Yeah, a third. That's and a in that third, you know, it comes in all, all facets of um, plastic surgery, you know, noses, and I do a ton of revisional breasts or terrible liposuction or awful scars or thing of that nature. And, you know, the reason for it is that, you know, it's a craft. It, it's an art form. You know, I use the analogy. And I say, look, for example, my breasts lift with implant. Takes me about five hours. Wow. Five hours. So the standard breast lift and implant in the U.S. is probably two and a half, three hours. So you ask yourself, I mean, I'm a fast talker and I'm a fast operator, but you cannot speed up detail. So if I said to you, I want you to make, I want you to make me a flan cake, mm -hmm. but you only have four minutes to make it. How good would that flan be? If I said to you, I want you to paint me a mural, but I need you to do it in 13 minutes. So the reality is if you take a look at anything creative, music, art, food, but then you, you, you speed it up in that process, the details, the specificity of it, the accuracy of it is lost. And so surgery is like anything else. And what ends up happening is there's a cost benefit analysis. So, you know, you know, I always use the analogy of Hermes versus coach. Not that I care about brands, but I think it, uh, ex it really explains to people, you know, you buy an Hermes bag, the stitching, the leather, the base, they're both bags, the coach bag, the Hermes bag, they do the same thing. So I say, if a patient wants to have skin removed, I'm probably overkill. If a patient is into details, the size of their areolas, how thin the scar is, the symmetry, the shape, the little nuances, well, that doesn't happen accidentally. That happens by intention. So a breast lift with implant, if you want the two breasts to actually be really symmetrical, you want the scars to be really thin and become invisible, you want the areolas to match, how the hell can I do that in two and a half hours? I, I cannot. I physically cannot. So I don't have my tech clothes. I, don't, I can't rush it. So what's happened is it's become a, more and more of a business model and time is money in surgery. In other words, if I do something in five hours and I do the same exact thing in two and a half hours, well, I just saved two and a half hours worth of operating costs and money. I make more money, but we both know that that's impossible. So, um, yeah, I do a ton more revisions and the revisions is the, where this whole frustration initiated from, you know what I mean? Let's say you have the secret, you know, and you have to tell people one at a time, Hey, by the way, you'll get crazy after a while. You want to get the message out. Hey, Hey, be careful. Hey, watch out for that pothole. Hey, watch out for that pothole. So that's where we are. I'm trying to tell people about the pothole. Beautiful. Now, earlier when you and I were talking, you also said, that you turn people away. Now talk about a, a cost model. I'm sure there's some doctors that don't turn anyone away that are whatever you ask. They're like, yeah, we can, we can get that done. And you actually said you turn people away. Well, I mean, of course I turn people away. I mean, we it's don't... not enough course, Dr. No, Raban. That's it, not it, enough for, course. For, for us, it's enough course. And because the reality is, is you think about it, not every single person who's sitting at home who decides, wow, I really need to change something about myself who walks through the door is right. They're just not. The fact that you walk through my door doesn't mean you're a candidate, right? The fact that you sat at home and you looked at your nose or you looked at your belly or you didn't like your ears or whatever, and then you came here and you said to me, hey, by the way, Dr. Raban, could you? So that is at the discretion of the professional, professional meaning your doctor. Your doctor needs to be able to decipher if the needs and wants that you have are actually reasonable and doable. So those are totally different things. Reasonable means like, yeah, I can see that. I can see what you're talking about. Doable is, okay, I see what you're talking about. Now I can actually execute that. Because the problem is there's two reasons why doctors are over-operating. Two reasons. Okay. Greed, aka, listen, I have a heavy duty rent. I've had four divorces. I have a boat I need to pay for. Whatever. Yeah. So I need the money or ego. I can do this. Oh, I, yes. I, your four-time revisional knows, oh, I, those guys didn't know what they were doing. Whoa. I'm going to fix this. So for me. They sound equally dangerous, by the way. They, I was going to say that greed was worse, but once you described ego, that kind yeah, of got so scary. It, well, well, that's the cocktail for disaster. And that's why these numbers are going sky high. Because people, doctors are beginning to think they're better than they are, which we already know doctors have a little tendency towards that. Mm -hmm. And greed, at the end of the day, drives almost everybody in the world. So for me... The idea is you come in, I take a look at you, and then I ask myself, do I really feel that I can make you better? Can I, can I hit it out of the park? Not can I get a first base and you're going to look 
mildly improve, not a lateral movement where you look different but not better. Can you? Can I hit it out of the park? And if I think I can hit it out of the park, then I'm going to consider it. So what are the reasons I won't operate on you? Well, number one, you are looking at something the wrong way. In other words, you think you have something wrong with you when in reality, I don't really see it. And I have, that happens. I've had beautiful young girls come to my office with beautiful noses, maybe a tiny little hump or gorgeous breasts that they want just a little bit bigger. And I'm like, no, I, I, just don't see, I just don't see what you see. In other words, I don't see it the way you do. If someone told you, and you both, me and you walked outside and like, look at the sky, it's so green. And you're like, green? No, no, it's, it's blue. What are you talking about? So if I don't see what you see, I can't operate on you. That's number one. Secondly, you're just not a good candidate. Like you'll come in, you're five foot two. And I told you this earlier, you're five foot two and you weigh 185 pounds. Okay, no problem. And I want a tummy tuck. Can't help you. Too much tummy. Can't help you. Can't tuck it. Can't, can't, can't help you. <laughs> you need to go lose 40 pounds and you need to come back and then I can hit it out of the park. And so you need it. You know, everybody, every surgeon will have their own internal barometer. You would hope and you would think that we, meaning us doctors, would be holding ourselves to a higher level and we would be like you would expect from clergy and from teachers and from firemen and from police officers sort of have a higher level of integrity where we would do the right thing. But we know that that isn't the case. And so where does the onus fall? On the patient. To, to the know onus the falls on the patient. Because those days where you could just walk in and say, hey, doctor, what do you think? Can you help me? Those are gone. That doesn't exist. I'm sorry to tell you that. You have to watch your own back. And I, you got to do the homework. That's it. I, uh, I'm, I'm going to push a couple of buttons in you. Earlier we were talking about... Um, some things that really drive you crazy. And you mentioned some pet peeves earlier, but I'm going to throw the word out there. Uh, like the Cooper mini you. Yeah. Yeah. The word mini sends my you right. Favorite, my favorite word mini. Yeah. Let's just, just dish. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, it's this notion and the frustration is, is the, is the, mini is it a real thing? No. So what it bothers me, what is mini? Mini is a term that is put as an adjective. You can see I'm anti adjectives is the adjective that doctors use to, make reference to surgeries to minimize or make seem less in, in, invasive for patient. Mini facelift, mini tummy tuck, mini this, mini that, lunchtime this, lunchtime that. Where did all this crap come from? It came from the fact that as a, as a, as a community, we, people, it's competitive. And so what doctors started to realize is that patients were afraid of facelifts like either afraid or were insulted that they needed a facelift. And so if I threw the word mini in front of it, you'd be more apt to do a facelift because you're not getting a facelift. You're getting a mini facelift. You're not getting, I'm not getting a tummy tuck. Oh no, no, I don't. I'm getting a mini tuck. It's all garbage. It's all adjectives that are used in order. Now, are there are instances? Yes. Where someone does need a, a they're, they're 50 instead of 80 and they need a facelift that's lesser in, less invasive. So I'm not saying that the word in of itself is completely off limits. I'm just saying that it's being overused. And so what it actually stems from and what really irks me is the manipulation in the marketing that's being done to draw in patients. So it would be the equivalency of a ice cream truck that has all kinds of nice pictures of famous Disney characters <laughs> and very nice Disney music, but inside is a pedophile. It's Whoa. drawing in, it's drawing in and manipulating children. And when they sell e-cigarettes to kids, they put them in bubblegum flavors. Yeah. So they're, they are targeting unsuspecting people. That's what pisses me off. Because the reality is you're having a facelift. And with a facelift comes facelift risks. Facelift downsides. People and die in facelifts. And, and facelift downtime. Yeah. So this it's idea that I'm going to get I'm going to get a mini lift and I'm going to have it done and I'm going to be back to work on Tuesday, it's a nonsense. It's a big surgery. It's a big surgery. So hence why I get I get there's little, nothing mini about I get a little test having your face cut into yes and uh, and and I'm I'm going to throw the phrase out, Doctor Google. So Dr. Google is a phrase. Look yeah. at that face. Yeah. Look at the face he they made. They can't see my face. It's podcast. So you'll just have to describe the, my nostril flaring. Dr. Google is the new phenomenon. So we went from having no information as patients 
to having too much information as patients, right? Dangerous. You went from walking in and not knowing anything about procedures and sort of being super naive at, like, let's say in the 80s, to now everyone thinks they know everything about everything. So watch a few YouTubes, do a little podcast, check out a couple of websites, a few vlogs, and boom, I'm an expert. So when a patient comes to me and they say, hey, I, how, how can I help you? What's going on? And they say, oh, I'm here. I need a anchor mass apexy with a superior medial pedicle with a 325cc silicone implant moderate profile. I'm thinking to myself like, oh, okay, well. Is that English? Did you just speak English? That was, yeah. That was, <laughs> that was, that was uh, doctor talk. Okay. Uh, I'd say, I, I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, good luck. Because what happens is you go online and now you have all this information in your head. And the reality is that shouldn't have been the conversation. The conversation should have gone something as follows. Hi, doctor. How are you? You know, I've had several children and I breastfed a lot. And, you know, my breasts have changed since that time. And I've lost a little bit of volume and my breasts are a little saggy. And I'm not, I don't really like the way they look. And I'd love for them to be a little bit more youthful, maybe a little perky. What do you suggest? And then we start a dialogue. Okay. And it's, you know, it's neither paternalistic, a.k.a. I know better. You don't know what you're talking about. Those days are gone. Mm -hmm. Nor patient knows best. I'm here to serve. I'm your Uber driver. Tell me where you want to go. I'll do it. It's collaborative. This is collaborative medicine. So you come and tell me what's wrong with you. And then your doctor better know how to explain to you what he or she thinks is wrong, what your options are, and what they suggest. If they're not capable of doing that, then you got a problem. But you walking in and saying, I want X, and them giving it to you is a catastrophe. Okay, so, so we'll have a practice one. Hello, Dr. Raban. My name Hi. is Monique Marvez. Hi, Monique. I'm a comedian, air talent, writer, performer, and uh, I have three Showtime specials. I'm gearing up for my fourth one, and I've lost quite a bit of weight. Uh, I've lost some volume. I had some implants put in in the 90s. I would like, you know, in, in the parlance of our day, a hooter hike. Uh, I want them just like you said. I want them more youthful. I want them in the right place. I, what what would you suggest? Like, was that good? Did I do that well? That was well? good. You're excellent. You see, you're, you're, you, you learn well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I paid attention. Yeah. So yes. And then what would happen is I'd ask you a bunch of questions Uh huh. and then I'd examine you and then I'd sit down and say, okay, Monique, well, here's what's going on. Mm -hmm. These are your options. Mm -hmm. Not this is what you need. These are your options. But okay. This is the option that I think is best for you. And this is why. And here are the risks. And this is what it's going to take to recover. Now go think about it. That's the conversation goes. It doesn't go that way. It goes, I want my breast bigger, fuller, whatever. I think I need a bigger implant. Yeah, okay, sure, I agree. We can do that for you. Done. I, you it sounds ridiculous. Like I'm like being, I'm being, I'm being uh, sort of sensational for the sake of pot. No, that's actually how it's happening. If anything, doctors not even seeing the patients. Many times the coordinator or the office consultant sees them. 100%, I've seen it. My, my consult's an hour. One hour, one hour of my time. Consults are like 20 minutes. Yeah. How if, can we talk about anything in 20 minutes? So I think that's really, really, uh, really important. Beautiful. Well, then that means that we have wrapped up our very first episode, our maiden voyage, if you will, of Plastic Surgery Uncensored with Dr. Roddy Raban. It's a pleasure. I'm excited. I think we have a lot, a lot of good uh, to do ahead of us. If you loved Plastic Surgery Uncensored, and I'm sure you did, I don't even want to say if, we would love to get your feedback. If you enjoyed and found our podcast helpful, tell us why. Give us the review and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. We can be found on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeart, or you can go directly to revolverpodcast.com. If you have a topic you would like us to talk about, then please reach out to us on Facebook, Roddy Rabon, Instagram at Dr. Roddy Rabon or RoddyRabon.com. You are listening to Plastic Surgery Uncensored with Dr. Roddy Rabon on Revolver Podcast. <laughs>